Sporting Journal Radio, presented by Onyx. All right, our next guest is a is a busy, busy guy, uh, not just from doing various other podcasts in addition to, to ours, but he's continuing to bring us high-quality content on his YouTube channel and now working with Meat Eater. It's Jay Siemens. He joins us on the show. Uh, Jay, thanks for taking time out and uh, joining us here today. Thanks, guys. Congrats on the, on the Meat Eater partnership, first of all. That's awesome. Hey, that that would kind of just came out of the blue, like uh, – my uh my wife and i started mediator like starting started watching it on netflix i don't know maybe two years ago and she became like just like obsessed with it like watching it faster than i could just binge watching it and it kind of got her into outdoor you know hunt, hunting shows and that sort of stuff so it was, it was pretty cool and all of a sudden i got an email from them and she's like no you're joking i'm like no it's it's i don't know it's social media right anyone can see any video so you never know who's who's watching something when you put it on youtube right and apparently someone from media was watching so yeah that's crazy so you just got an email one day and they're like I hey, got this, an email. This, is, this is meat eater uh we want you to do some stuff for us Th- that's basically what it was and i was just like <laughs> okay well i'll believe like i i i feel like i've i've had enough instances where i've had those exciting you know uh, you know opportunities present themselves and then something falls through like i um yeah, I've had trips before. It's like, hey, we, Jay, we really want you to come film this trip. And then it's like things fall through at the last minute. So until it's actually happening, I, I really don't, I try not to get too excited about those things, but it, it did actually happen. And uh, yeah, it's just a cool, a cool crew to be, uh, to be working with. And yeah, uh, yeah they're, they're doing big things in the outdoor world. Well, Meat Eater is like a, a new media juggernaut right? Like it, yeah. it's been interesting to watch because you had the old traditional media, uh, you know, companies like the Linders and in fish and, yeah. and, uh, the outdoor sportsman group. And then all of a sudden just meat eater comes out. Obviously they had some help from Netflix, but they just kind of came out of nowhere. And now they've got all these podcasts. They got all these YouTube shows. They're just becoming kind of this outdoor media empire out there. Yeah. I, I think the in fisherman is, is a good uh, parallel to draw because yeah, they, and, and, and I think so many people have viewed uh, Meat Eater as just Steven Ronella for the mm-hmm. longest time. And that's, I think, the biggest thing that they were trying to not combat because we know, like, Steve, Steve's, you know, he's the man. He's, he's got just a massive amount of talent. Yeah. Um, but it's Meat Eater is so much bigger than just Steve now because they brought the amount of writing talent they have. Like, that's where they definitely uh, push into is a lot of their writers. If you look on their website, the amount of written content they have is, is uh, it's exceptional. So well, it's, I, it's cool. And, and yeah. Well, I was just going to say, I think that's what makes uh, Steve Rinella so good at his job is he comes from that writer background, you know, a, a good yeah. writer that can also translate to other media like like broadcast media, like television. That That's just going to make a, a host that's more well-versed in, you know, communicating and, and having a, a background, a knowledgeable background in the outdoors. I think that's really helped him and his company out. Oh, yeah. The way that he can articulate hunting to people that don't hunt. And mm-hmm. yeah, that, that's, that's a, that's a special skill for sure. Storytelling, man. And, yeah. and now the Canadian angle, tell us about the Canadian angle and what people can expect from it. Yeah. So, um, meat eater was just, they're, they're hoping to do more fishing stuff because you know, they are hunting focused. They said, Hey Jay, do you want to help, you know, build out the fishing side a little bit more? And so I, I kind of brainstormed some episode ideas and they were like, well, we need to come up with a name. So, you know, kind of a play on words with angling, angle most of the episodes are filmed in canada so canadian angle it kind of it kind of just worked out um obviously there's a place called the northwest angle as well on lake mm-hmm. of the woods which was a third play on words that i wasn't really even uh expecting but um yeah something that uh something that got brought up there um but yeah so i i just finished the second season we did one open water season that i i think went well and they said hey jay can you do an ice fishing season i'm like okay yeah let's let's film it this winter and we'll put it up next winter. And they're like, can you film it this winter? And we'll put it up in, in January. And I'm just like, uh, okay, well, we'll try. So that was, that was frantic to do it. I'm glad I did it. Cause I, I just, it was, it was a, you know, a cool opportunity and it, it worked out, but it was like that consumed a lot of my December, January. And it's, it's been pretty frantic. So to, so to get those seasons done, uh, it was cool. And to just share it with a, a different audience because I don't know. It's like every, and it's also like, I'm a little bit nervous too putting stuff on YouTube because I feel like everyone is there to watch Steve Rinella yeah. and they're not necessarily, not necessarily there to, to see me. So it's like 
you know, I, as much as you shouldn't do it, you're always reading the comments and you're like, Hey, w- what is someone going to think of this? And, but at the end of the day, it's, you know, it's as a creative, as a photographer, videographer, it's like, it's what I like to make, what I'm passionate about. And, uh, I, I think it was, it was well received. So yeah, I, I uh, it sounds like there'll probably be a third season. So, so nice. I'm excited about that. That's and, awesome, dude. Yeah. That's, you know, congratulations. Um, thank you. Is it like how much direction, you know, like how much input are they having? Are they just saying, Hey man, this is kind of what we're looking for. Go do your thing. Is it kind of an extension of what we see? You know, are you trying to make it an extension of what you're doing already? Just maybe, you know, trying to just kind of continuing to improve on your craft or yeah. is it, or do they have some ideas for you? No. And that, and that's probably like my, my favorite part is I'm, I'm always open to criticism and critique and like change the stuff. But as, as a videographer and I used to do, you know, the corporate stuff more, the worst thing when you do a video is like you create a video and they're like, Hey Jay, we got 18 changes for you to make. And you go back and forth. And the thing about what I do now and with YouTube is I make the video, I click upload and I don't, I don't really have to answer to anybody, which is, which is nice. Like I, not that I, not that I post controversial stuff, but it's just like, it's nice to be like, yep. I like the song choice. I like where that transition happened. I'm going to upload it. And of the eight episodes I've sent to meat eater, they haven't had any changes, no, no critiques, which, you know, from my standpoint, it makes it easier for me to keep creating um, because sometimes it'll just turn into hurdles after a while. And, and as a creative, um, y- you want to create how you want to create. And you, you don't always want to be micromanaged. And I've never felt that with media. They've been like, yep, they're all good to go. And that, and that's, that's, that's cool. I, I like that. So, I mean, I try to, I take my style and maybe I try to like, not mimic, but maybe just make sure it's a little more of like uh, fits into the meat eater style. Like if I was going to use more of an electronic, I don't want to say dubstep. I don't really use that much dubstep music, but like an electronic type song, I might swap it out for more of an acoustic, like folky song mm, for the meat eater sure. audience. Cause that's, that's what I visualize a little bit more. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's been a lot of fun and um, yeah, just connecting with the crew. And finally I, I, I was just in Devil's Lake uh, early yeah. January and got to meet with a bunch of the, I got to meet Steve finally and got to meet Cal, got to meet Chester and Seth. And uh, it, it was just great to, you know, to meet some of the, the main faces of meat eater and finally make that connection and, and fish Devil's Lake for the first time. So that was, that was a, a dream trip for me for sure. Well, that was something I was going to ask you about. Cause you, you're from not far from Devil's Lake, right? Just across the border from. Yeah. Like, kind I, of I grew Pembina. up like an hour and a, yeah, I grew up an hour and a half away, like right on the right on the border there, right by the the Pemina and Nietzsche crossings. Those are the two crossings I'm close to, and uh, Devil's Lake was always on my radar, but just you know never made it. It's it's just like there's lots to fish in Canada, but yeah. I wanted to go to Devil's, and and the thing that like sparked my interest in Devil's more than anything else was going to fish for the white bass. So I got to do mm-hmm. some white bass fishing when I was down there, and that was cool. Just something I'd never caught through the ice before, and then I don't know. I was uh, there. You go. Um, the white bass were super cool. We ate a couple and I got to experience, you know, dark house spearing for pike, which was probably my favorite part of the whole trip. I'd never been around that before. Hmm. Uh, like it's not, I, I don't think it's legal to spear pike in Manitoba or Ontario. It's just, yeah. So to be able to be part of that in North Dakota, it felt like a cultural Dakota type thing to be a part of. And that, that was, that was super cool. For sure. That's a great fishery there. Uh, of course. So I, I just want to back up one second to working with yeah. a, a group like meat eater because, I feel like, you know, what we're doing here, what you're doing there and what you've been able to accomplish with YouTube is being your own boss and having your own company. And there's always that worry. And it sounds like you don't have to worry about it, but there's always that worry when you end up doing, you know, working with a company that's a bigger company or a corporate type company and, and worry, you know, all of a sudden you're working for somebody else again. And yep. uh, a meat eater, I, I'd assume would be a little bit of a different situation since it seems like, you know, you're basically working with the same kind of dudes that, you know, you and I are, but yeah, you know, is it, is, was there that worry about, how much control you're going to have? Is it going to, you know, what direction this might go? Yeah. I think, I think if season one didn't go so smoothly, there, there probably wouldn't have been a a season two because that's, that's kind of the reason why I, you know, like doing the YouTube stuff. And that's why I've pushed more into the YouTube stuff than uh, doing, you know, commercial, commercial videography. I used to shoot a lot of stuff for different clients and, and um, you know, maybe YouTube isn't the most uh, you know, lucrative of, of channels I could have gone, but it's what I'm most passionate about. And, you know, for, for just what I like to do, there's, yeah, like, like you said, I'm not, I'm not being micromanaged yeah. and I, yeah. So, and meat eater has been just amazing for that. It's like, yep, yeah, 
you know, sometimes they'll bounce ideas. They'll be like, hey, Jay, what four videos are you thinking of? So I'll send them six ideas and they'll be like, yeah, let's do those four. And that's kind of as, as involved as they get. Perfect. And um, so it's, it's cool. Yeah, that's nice. You know, YouTube is a tough nut to crack. And I know creators aren't making as much money off YouTube as they used to. But if you can, if you can essentially create with some sponsors and get it on a platform like YouTube and then generate the amount of viewership, uh, you know, like you have like 114,000 subscribers, man, that's unreal. Like that's, that's I, I, like how long did it take you to get there? When did you start with that? And how, like a guy starting out on YouTube now, how does he get to that level? Yeah, I mean, I think the common, so I, I started off by filming for a guy named Aaron Weeb, Uncut Angling. If mm -hmm. you guys watch YouTube Fishing, you've probably seen Aaron's videos before. And something that I learned from Aaron is just like being tunnel visioned on it. And, and I think there's a lot of people that dabble with YouTube, but unless you go, you know, just head first into it. It's, it's really tough. Um, and that, and that's why it can, it can be tough. I was fortunate that I was in a position where I was a business owner and I had a flexible schedule and I had an, I had an editor on salary already. Right. So I had a guy oh. that could edit videos and then I could start making videos. A lot of these people that, it, you know, a lot of them still that do make their living on YouTube, they're editing all their videos themselves. Right. They come home from a trip, they edit for three days, they go fish again. And so like, yeah, I was, I, I, I started my channel four years ago with my production company going on. And I would say in the last two years, I was kind of just laser focused. I would take the odd corporate job, but it was like, I want to see what the potential is of YouTube. It's where I get the most joy and fulfillment from. It's, it's cool that I can, you know, meet great people. Like, you know, you guys and connect with, connect with people to watch the videos and all that stuff. And it's just like, I want to push more into that, even though, you know, like I said, it, it might not be lucrative. It's just like what I love. And it's, it's, you know, it's, it's been my dream to be a part of some sort of fishing show. I never needed to be in front of the camera. That was never like something that was like, I need to be in front of the camera. I was like, I want to be part of a fishing show. That was, that was my goal. And then when I started filming with Aaron, I was, you know, completely content being behind the camera. Now I'm in front. I could go to being behind the camera. If all of a sudden YouTube, you know, dried up tomorrow, I'd be, you know, back to shooting and I'd be telling stories and I'd be just as content. So um, just doing the YouTube thing now while it's, while it's working and trying to put as much, you know, uh, as much effort into it as I can. I think sometimes I, cause I do the same. I'm in front, I'm behind the camera. Sometimes I feel like being behind the camera. I have, I enjoy that more. I mean, everybody wants, yeah. you know, everybody that's been in this type of industry has wanted to host their own show or whatever, but man, I love getting the shot. Right. And then, yeah. and as, as tedious as video editing can be some days, I, that's, I spend all my, all my time editing videos. Now it seems like yeah. my arms hurt, like all my forearms. It's like carpal, carpal, tunnel. carpal tunnel. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. And here's the thing. This is, this is what I've heard. I've, I've heard Bill Linder say this and, and you know, some other people too. And I'll say it myself. I don't think I'm a fantastic angler. I think, you know, I can, I can find fish. I can catch fish from time to time, but I, I think I, I would pride myself in like the, you know, the, the, the filming and that aspect, because I think there's a lot of people that could catch the fish better than me. So I, I, I'm like, I want to be the guy that catches the shot, like the top water yeah. strike. Cause like everything has to go right to capture that in slow-mo and everything. So that's why like I get, I get just as much, if not more enjoyment from capturing a strike like that than, than catching the fish, catching the fish is great but I think there's people that could do it better than me. Yeah. Um, yeah, you know, it just sure. works out that sometimes I'm filming myself and it, it makes the most sense that I'm, I'm the guy catching the fish cause I'm, I'm got the camera on a tripod filming myself, but it, it could be, it could be anyone. Uh, I'll tell you my, my buddy, I love to fish too, but again, I'm the same way. There's guys that are better at it than I am, but my, all my buddies make fun of me for always having you. Are you really taking pictures of this again? Or for you really yeah. have to film this again? I'm like, well, yeah, it's like, I enjoy it. And that top water stuff, that slow-mo, um, we got to take a quick break for the radio network. But when we come back, I want to talk about some slow-mo footage with you. I want to talk about some of the films that you've made it, you've made because you do different styles of videos but those films i think those are definitely my favorite you did a week in the yukon a week in the amazon which is wild and uh and some other places too so we're going to talk uh talk about some of that stuff uh coming up more at jay siemens when we come back looking for winter adventure might as well pick a place with over 1,000 lakes Ottertail County, Minnesota is in the middle of everywhere, offers a simpler pace, and has something for everyone. 
find your inner otter at ottertillakescountry.com. We're back. Thanks for tuning into this station on the Sporting Journal Radio Network by downloading the podcast, or maybe you're watching us on YouTube, Facebook, Rumble, Instagram, wherever the place is that you're getting this stuff. Thank you very much. If you like it, share it with your friends. Our guest right now is Jay Siemens. He's uh, got the Canadian angle with the meat eater, media juggernaut. He's also got his own juggernaut on YouTube with 114,000 subscribers. He does a good job. And one of the reasons, Jay, I think that you're successful, we were talking about it before the break, is... Uh, obviously, you know how to catch fish, but you're and you're and you're great with a camera. But I think you're also like just a good person, right? Like people enjoy, I think, some seeing someone that's you know kind of down to earth. Obviously, you have to have some personality. You're good on camera, but you do good work, and you seem like a nice guy. And I think that translates to the content that you're you're creating. And I think a lot of people uh, can relate to that, or, or you know, resonate with that. Thank you. Yeah. I don't know. Like I, something that I always strive to, you know, create when I'm creating content is like, I want something that everybody can watch too. I'm, I'm very careful. I just know that like the internet's a scary place and like a lot of parents will just give their kids their devices and oh, not yeah. that, you know, so it's, it's like, I, I would, you know, I want my videos to be something that any, any kid can pick up and watch and, 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 you know, just, you know, maybe it can, make their day a little bit better or give them a laugh or they can learn something. So that, that's kind of like one of the, the core things I think about when I, when I make videos and uh, I'm always hard on myself. I don't think I have a, a great personality for the video. I think I'm lucky that I know the camera stuff, but <laughs> I always give myself a hard time. Like if you want to watch them entertaining, there's a lot more people that are entertaining. I think, I think I can get a little bit emotional. My wife can say I get a very emotional when it comes to fishing and losing fish and catching fish, <laughs> but uh, that, that's a different conversation. So yeah, well, thank you. Well, and you, I mean, so you, you kind of cut your teeth, so to speak, maybe with, with Aaron, who's definitely a personality. Yeah. Um, yeah. With, that was uncut. Was that your first, yep. the first show you were filming for? And you did yeah, that that's, for, that's, for about five yeah, years? Yeah, yeah, five years or so. And that's kind of where I learned how to use, you know, video cameras and, and learned videography. I, I just got thrown into it, basically. And when you decided to kind of go and do your own thing, were you nervous about doing that or were you excited about that opportunity? Um, you know, it was like that's that's when my you know media business was was uh, I was probably on the road for at that point in my life. I was probably on the road for like 200 days a year, just shooting like different wow. corporate and travel and tourism stuff. So I was like, Oh, you know what? I should start a YouTube channel and I can look back on these videos in a couple of years and it'll, it'll be cool. Cool memories. Right. It was never like, no, I want to be, that's how it started. Uh, yeah. Oh, really? Like if you look at my first, if you look at my first couple of videos, it's like me, uh, you know, giving tips and tricks on like wedding photography or me going to Newfoundland with a buddy and just like, bringing a camera along and, and trying to, trying to teach and just trying to document. And I was like, Oh, this will be cool to watch back on. And it was never like, I'm going to become a YouTuber. It was like, I, I wanted, you know, it's, it's another, I'm making these videos. Like I said, I have an editor. Um, let's, let's make some videos and, and it'll be a cool way to document things. And it was, it was only really when like, um, you know, Manitoba tourism was like, mm. we, mm. we want you to, you know, help promote Manitoba and we'll, we'll help you, build your YouTube channel. We'll help promote and we'll sponsor you financially. And I was just like, okay, yeah, like let's, let's try, let's see. Right. And, and then kind of after a year or two of that, then I was like, okay, well, you know, maybe I should start saying no to some of these other jobs and see what, what can happen with YouTube. And you know, the, the rest was just kind of putting my head down and, and making videos. And that's, and that's the tough thing about YouTube for breaking into it because like you need to be laser focused on it. You need to be like, you know, I was, I was talking to some other guys and they're like, you know, we, we make TV shows, but like, how, how do you, you know, get into YouTube? And it's like, here's the thing. It's like, if I was focused on making TV shows, I wouldn't be focused on making YouTube videos. If I was focused on guiding or like, let's say winning tournaments, there's very few, a lot of tournament anglers have YouTube channels, but there's not a lot of tournament anglers that could win tournaments and, you know, have thriving YouTube channels. There's like Brandon Palahniuk and like, uh, Scott Martin, those guys have been able to do the crossover and done both, but it's, it's, it's a tough deal. Cause as soon as you're focused on cameras, you're not focusing on catching fish. And it's, yeah. it's that inner battle all the time. And that's when people start filming. They're like, Jay, how do you, uh, how do you, how do you know when to like film and then just not get caught up in the fishing? And it's like, well, you just have to be, you know, you have to be focused on, on getting the shot. Otherwise, if you just get caught up in the fishing, you'll never get that video, yeah. right? You so. almost have to make that decision before you go. Am, am I going to yeah. film 
Am I going to fish? Am I going to do a little bit? Of, like, what's the priority here today? Yeah. And, yeah. It, you know, and it's funny. I, I do a lot with uh, with Tourism Saskatchewan over there and do some stuff with those guys. And, and yeah. the, I'll go out fishing and, and to film some fishing. And I'll do some fishing with them, too. But they always want to start fishing right away. I'm like, guys, can I... Can I get, can I put a microphone on you first? Oh, that's my pet peeve. If someone drops down, especially my wife, I'll give her her time. Sam, if she, if she, like we get to the spot and she'll just like rig on and you know, she, she's a good angler and she'll rig up a, a minnow on her rod and drop it down. And then she'll catch a fish and that'll just make my blood boil. I'm like, wait, <laughs> wait one second, wait till I'm ready. And I mean, I get it. She just, she, like, it takes so long to set everything up, which you don't, you don't see often. Right. It's just yeah. like, but it's, it's all good. Got to get that Sam cam fired up. Yeah. yeah, that's great. So, um, you growing up, you wanted to, to have a fishing show. Did you ever imagine it wouldn't be on an actual channel? <laughs> yeah, no, I don't think, I don't think, I mean, you, yeah, YouTube wasn't YouTube a thing. Wasn't a and thing like, yeah. And I, I've said this a couple times, but it's just like the fact that I've heard recently is like more kids want to be YouTubers and want to be astronauts. Not, not that I wanted to be an astronaut, but that was just like a thing kids said when they were right. age. they wanted to play in the NHL or something. And now it's like, oh, I want to be a YouTuber. And it just, it wasn't a, it wasn't a thing. Even when Aaron and Uncut Angling started in, in like 20, 2011, it was just like companies were unsure. It's like, Hey, do we really want to promote on YouTube? And now like, I don't know about you guys, but for me, I watch, I watch more YouTube than TV. Like I don't, I don't have a cable subscription. I don't have satellite. Like it's just the focus is uh, YouTube because it's, it's something current. It's, I can watch it right away. And yeah. Well, I, I go back and forth because I do an actual TV show too that airs on a yeah. bunch of PBS stations. So I still, yeah. and I'm an old radio guy, so I still have some love for traditional media. But you know, Dan is living here with me now, and and we're working on this stuff pretty much every day. And and the last few nights, especially getting ready for this, we were watching. We were on YouTube every night watching videos, a lot of your stuff, and you know, just different. And then we're we're having a a party coming up in April on the Rainy River. So, nice. um, we've been watching a bunch of spring fishing on the rainy river, which what was, oh, one, that's of, cool. one was yours too. Yeah. But, uh, so it, uh, YouTube is, a it's an interesting thing. And being a, a traditional media guy for a long time, I didn't, I didn't put a lot of stock into YouTube yet. And even podcasts for that matter. I'm like, I do a real radio show Pff, podcast. That, it's, now, funny, it's funny though. Like, because my, my dad, he's just retired, but he worked in the radio industry for 45 years. Oh really? And I always gave him grief. And I said, dad, you know, radio is on the way out. And he's like, no, no, you watch. And I said that to him for the past 10 years and radio is still, radio is still oh, crushing yeah. it. Right. Oh yeah. And, and so it's like, it, it all has its place. I think it's, mm -hmm. it's shifting around, but I think, you know, I don't think TV is going to go away overnight. I think, I think radio is still, there's still things that you get with radio that you don't get with podcasts and you don't get with YouTube. So, yeah. Yeah. It, it's, there's, it'll, there'll always be a place for over the air broadcasts. And especially when you, if you end up in a situation like what, what's happening in Ukraine where they lost the internet. I mean, can you imagine, could you imagine in America or even Canada for that matter, if, if the internet went away, like what some of those well, people younger, would die with yeah. the younger generations, they'd have no idea. Like when I, when I'm speaking to a younger generation, I use the word podcast before I use the word radio, when I describe what I do. And you yeah. know, if I'm talking to an older crowd, I'm like, yeah, it's a radio show. And we also have the podcast. If it's a younger crowd, yeah, we have this podcast. You can watch it on yeah. YouTube, you know, <laughs> it's, That's uh, great. you got, it's all about knowing your audience. And then, so when you were, I want to talk about guiding too, because where are we at for time, Dan? We got to take another break, by the way. We're good. All right. So when you were 15, you started guiding yeah. at Eagle Nest Lodge in the Winnipeg River and you sunk a boat. Yeah. So I, I saw that. I saw you talk about it, but I don't think you told the story about sinking the boat. Can you tell the story? Did you tell the story? I, can't yeah, if you told I, I can tell you the story. I've, I've, I've told the story a couple of times. Um, and it, I think it gets a little funnier every time. So yeah, I, when I, when I got dropped off to, to start guiding, I didn't have my drivers yet. So I was 15 at the time. My parents dropped me off and uh, I got shipped up to the lodge for the summer. And it was like my first week of guiding. And we uh, were going into Portage Lake. So we would hop in the camp boats, little tillers with like 40 mercs. We would drive up to the Southern Lake, park at the bottom of the waterfall, hike to the top, fish for the day, come back down. So we're coming back down after having a great day of fishing and you know, I'm feeling all proud. I'm young. I'm 15. We caught a bunch of walleyes. I'm like, this is a good day. This is the life we hopped back in the boat and it had been raining all day. And you know, a trick that I knew before then was if there's water in the bottom of the boat and the bilge, the bilge wasn't working, the bilge pump, um, you pull the plug. And sure. as long as you're driving, the water will drain out the bottom. Right. So <laughs> I pull the plug 
we start making our way back and it's a 40, 45 minute boat ride. So, you know, I have the memory of a goldfish if, if you know me <laughs> at all. And so we get back to the dock, all the water's drained out. I tie up the boat. I go up for dinner and there's like the guide quarters where all the guides are eating. And all of a sudden a guide comes in and he's like, Jay, or he, he addresses all the guys. He's like, guys, we all got to get out to the dock. We got a boat sinking. And I'm like, Oh no, whose boat is sinking. I feel so bad for that guide. So we start walking down the dock and as we get closer and closer, I'm just like, that's, that's my dock slip. And I see just the cowling of the motor sticking out <laughs> and I'm like, no, 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 no. There's no way this is mine. So yeah, of course it's my boat. And they all look at me. They're like, okay, Jay, you got to hop back in. So they give me a plug. I hop in the water, fully clothed, put the plug back in the boat. All four guides, you know, grab a corner of the boat, lift it up. They have like a commercial sub pump to pump out all the water. And um, they're like, okay, now you got to go tell the boss what happened. So the owner is having a nice sit down dinner with his wife in the dining room. So there I am dripping wet, 15 years old. I go up to the dining room. I'm like, Fred, uh, yeah, I, I, uh, I pulled the plug and I forgot to put it back in and I sunk a boat. And he's like, okay, well, just don't do it again. And he was, he, he couldn't have been any better about it. The boat had to get shipped into Lac de Bonnie to get worked on. And it was fine. It was just like, had to drain the water out, but, uh, safe to say I've not made that mistake again. <laughs> and, uh, I've told, yeah, like people that, that story just spread like wildfire and it was, it was, it was funny. I can laugh about it. Um, yeah, that's great. But yeah, you know, I've, I, that's the only boat I've sunk. I've, I've hit my fair share of rocks, but that's it for sunk boats at least. And you, you got talked to on your first day too, because you outfished your clients. Guiding is, is a lot of people don't realize that guiding is a little bit different than fishing, isn't it? Oh yeah. 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 Like it's, it's a no, no looking back on it. And, and now that I've, I have been guided once in a while, when I go to film at a lodge, it's like, unless, unless the person you're fishing with very explicitly says, pick up a rod. I don't yeah. think the guide should be fishing. Right. And that was just, you know, it's, it's me being green. That's, that was the best way to learn was I screwed up and I got sat down by, you know, the owner and the guide manager and they were so gracious about it. And they said, Jay, you, you just, you can't fish. These people are paying, paying a lot of money to come up here. You, yeah. you can't be fishing in front of them. I'm like, but they couldn't catch the fish. I wanted to catch the bass. <laughs> they were missing it. You know, so well, sometimes uh, I, I learned very quickly. I think there's something too about at least showing them how to catch it once in a while. I think the guide has. Yeah, to I, I think, I think a cast or two is okay. Yeah. yeah. All right. We got to take, a, we do have to take a quick break on the network. Actually, we're going to wrap up the radio show right now, but we got more on the podcast with Jay Siemens right after this. Keeping sheep on the mountain. That's the goal of the Wild Sheep Foundation. And you can help by attending the Midwest chapter of the Wild Sheep Foundation's annual banquet, March 25th and 26th at the Minneapolis Marriott Southwest in Minnetonka. This year, you could win your very own doll sheep on the Yukon. Plus, enjoy keynote speakers like conservationist Shane Mahoney, president and CEO of the Wild Sheep Foundation, Gray Thornton, and the British Columbia Backcountry Hunters and Anglers Chapter Liaison, Bill Hanlon. Plus, there'll be live and silent auctions and seminars put on by the Hunt and Fool. For more information, go to MidwestWildSheep.com. 852 million acres of public land, 147 million private properties, all in the palm of your hand. The number one hunting GPS app just got better. With hundreds of custom map layers, 3D and topographic maps, you can easily scout on the road or at home before you go. And now you can get important weather details, CWD detection, and even know what crops have been planted where. Get the most trusted hunting GPS app ever made. Onyx. Know where you stand with Onyx. All right, we're back here on the podcast. Thank you very much for watching. Jay Siemens is our guest. Jay, I want to talk to you about traveling and filming some of these. I don't know what to call them. Like we, we do some trips where we film and make like a, like a vlog and I, I call them adventure videos or trip videos. I haven't quite figured out the, the best name for them yet. And I, I think my favorite from, from what you do is when you do the, the films, you got a whole playlist on YouTube of films and it's a, there's a week in the Yukon, a week in the Amazon and you you tie in not only do you tie in the story of where you're going and some interviews and things like that but you work in so much of the cinematic elements to filming and i love the eye candy i mean that's i think that's my favorite it, content is king you have to have content i like to say like uh you could you could film bigfoot with a 1998 flip phone and you're going to probably have the most widely viewed video in the world um, so you have to have some content, but making that, making it look good is, uh, is, is so important when you, when you go out and film something, do you know ahead of time, is this going to be a film? Is this going to be, um, you know, more, more of a vlog story? What's your thought process going into making a video? Yeah. So I, it, it typically something I would decide ahead of time. 
um, there's different ways to look at it. And it depends like that Yukon trip, I could have split it into, you know, six different days, but I was like, that was, that was my first like film. And I was like, I want to experiment. I want to try some voiceover. Uh, it'll be, it'll be a way that I can tell a story in a different way. And so if I'm doing a one day trip, it, it likely won't turn into a film. There's, there's not necessarily enough of a story that might be, I might be teaching a technique or just bringing you along for half day. But if I'm doing something, you know, bigger, a little more special, it'll probably turn into a film. And what makes it a film, you know, probably a little more leaning into the cine- cinematography side and then the voiceover. Um, but like when people ask me, they're like, Jay, what, you know, what should I do? I, I want to make YouTube videos. What would you suggest for, you know, being successful? And it's like, well, you got to make what you want to make. I, that Yukon video was like, I want to make it cause I want to make like, that's just, I want to be creative in that way. I want to make a film. So that was an experiment. And I think you always got to experiment as, as a creator and it, 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 I think it worked out good. It got, you know, a good response. P- people viewed it. So um, yeah, I, I definitely like doing the film style and it's something that I think I look back on and I don't know. I know, I know the work that went into it, the editing on those films. Uh, I'm locked away in my office for a long time working on those. And because there's just more room for creativity, like yeah. s- some of those films I'll, just for the sake of the flow, sometimes I'll combine days to make it flow a little better. I'll cut out complete days. Like uh, I went to the Arctic this summer and I just cut a couple days out of the trip because I didn't feel like they told the story in the way I wanted to tell it. Um, not, not to try to ever give someone a false perception of the fishing or something, but it's like one day we went out uh, e-biking and I'm like, well, I don't, I don't think the fishing crowd is going to care about e-biking. The yeah. footage wasn't that special. Let's just scrap that entire day. So that day got cut out of the film. And that's something that, you know, it, you can decide to do when, when you're editing, right. You, you, you can call the shots and uh, the films are, yeah, they're, I, I like, I look looking back on them every once in a while and being like, oh, I remember that trip, especially the ones, you know, with my wife, it's, it's cool to have those memories on film. Absolutely. And by the way, Dan, play that last clip from Wolf Lake there that you played from the Yukon with Todd. Cause this slow motion grayling footage, I could just watch that on a loop. <sighs> like the, the one where it comes up and eats the, eats that fly, man, that, that was incredible. It was, it was a special place. Like I, when I, when I walked up there and saw the grailing everywhere, I'm like, this shot right here. I may never, I may never be able to get grailing footage like that again. So I spent, you know, a couple hours just filming the takes Yeah. and it's the type of thing where if I was just trying to film a video that day, I might not have taken all that time to do that. But in the sake of the film, I'm like, this might be one little piece in the film and uh, let, you know, let's do it. So um, yeah, I, th- that's what I love about YouTube stuff is you can, you can change it up. There's no, there's no formula, right? It's not like I need to make a 22 minute TV show needs to be cut exactly yeah, to that. Right. And, uh, you know, that's, make it as long as love, you need to make video. it is what I like to tell people, you know, as yeah. long as you is, if it, if it, if it's compelling, people will watch it till the end, no matter how long it is. That's, that's there's, how I determine lengths a lot of times. Yeah. There's a, a phrase I heard in a, a storytelling workshop I went to. And the guy said, basically, he said like, you want to leave, leave the scene or enter the scene late and leave the scene early in the fact that like give the people the best of the best and mm-hmm. not too much filler. So like at the end, it's like, Oh man, I, I can't wait till the next one. Cause That's... I don't, I don't want people to, I don't want people to be clicking off at 75%. Right. I want it to end and be like, Oh man, that was, I wanted more of that. I wanted to see more strikes, but it's like, no, you got, you got to, you know, keep them wanting. Right. That's so hard too, because you might have a great, another great shot that you yeah. feel like deserves to be in there. And it's like, how do you, how do you cut that stuff out? And you're right. You gotta, you get, you gotta just make it the best of the best. And, and when, when all that work, you said you took, you spent hours getting that shot, not to mention traveling with all that gear. And I know what it's like to have to travel with all that gear and then put it on a float plane and travel with all that gear. Yeah. Packing is a nightmare. And then just trying to make sure nothing's right. Have you ever, how, how many cameras have you broken on some of these trips? Uh, I've gone through a lot of drones. I feel like drones oh, are the yeah. things I break the most, but I'm probably on like my seventh or eighth drone. But over the last couple of years, I've just tried to streamline all of my gear and cameras are getting smaller. And mm-hmm. I mean, this is, this is my workhorse for 95% of my stuff. Now this is an a seven S three. And it's amazing what this little camera can do and what's all packed into it. I used to need to carry this big camera along specifically for slow-mo shots. I would bring this big Sony FS five and I would use it just for, I would use it just for slow-mo shots and then it would go back in my backpack. And now I can do everything with that small camera and the drones fold up now, like the original phantoms, I'd have to bring an extra case on the flow plane and now it folds up so I can fit like, you know, professional level gear, everything I need in a backpack 
And, you know, I try not to overcomplicate it because like we said, getting the Bigfoot shot with a flip phone is more important than not getting the shot at all. You get, yeah. you get these red cameras, these $60,000 cameras, and they take a minute to boot up. I can't tell you how many times like the animals right in front of you or the fish is right in front of you and you don't have time for the camera to boot up. So it's like a lot of people are watching the content on their phones or mm-hmm. on smaller, you know, computer screens. And it's like, I think there's a place for red cameras and all that high end stuff. But I've just realized that getting the shot will always trump the resolution or, yeah. you know, well, I've got a buddy that filmed with a films, a TV show, a pretty big TV show. And he filmed with a red for a while. And then he started getting shooting with a GH five and he's yeah. like, I, I couldn't tell. Like I was yeah. watching some of the footage. I couldn't tell half the time, which camera was. So now he uses that GH five so often. And I got, so I went and bought a GH five and then, nice. and then my buddy had an R R six, the new Canon yeah. R six. And I played around with that and I'm like, all right, I got to go buy an R six now. So that's, that's mostly what I shoot with, but we have S- yeah. FS fives at nice. Prairie Sportsman at the TV show. How, how nice is it with that uh, Sony that you're shooting, you're shooting slow motion with that Sony versus the FS five? Because yes, FS5 yeah. was good, good quality, but it was goofy how you had to work the slow motion on those. Yeah, like the the, uh, the FS5 had like the burst function, so you'd only get eight seconds of slow-mo. Mm-hmm. And now with this camera, you can do, uh, you know, unlimited slow-mo. The problem with that is sometimes you fill up way more uh, way more footage, right? Because before, <laughs> I could wait till the, the, there's, this is getting real geeky and technical, but there's a setting <laughs> called, N, there's a setting called end trigger. And basically it's always buffering whatever you're right. filming. When you press the button, it'll take the eight seconds before. So that's like the dream for filming top water strikes because you follow the lure every cast. Only when the fish eats, you count to four in your head, you press the button and it takes, you know, the eight seconds beforehand. So that was the best for filming top water. If I film it with this camera now, uh, you're just rolling continuous oh, and you God. fill up a lot of memory cards. I got so many clips of just the top water just going across the water, <laughs> you know, yeah. not, nothing happening. But yeah, I, I forgot. I guess that would be a nice situation to have that. I like a pre record or a uh, yeah. trigger or uh, something like that. But yeah. um, where, where, where do you want to travel that you haven't traveled to yet? Oh, man. Um, I definitely want to do more fishing in Europe. Like mm. I, I don't, I've done, I don't even know if I've done any fishing in Europe. Um, yeah. Like I, I'd love to do Xander. I love walleye fishing. So I think Xander is like the next step. Um, and I've got friends in Sweden too, that do a lot of pike fishing and perch fishing. So I think that would just be something unique. I love the, the cultural differences and stuff um, there beyond, beyond them being, you know, different species of fish as well. So I, I think some Europe stuff would be cool. And I think there's, you know, more to see in, you know, South, I mean, yeah, there's, there's endless opportunities. So I, I just want, I, I get, I have an issue with going to the same place twice. Sure. And you know, it, it's, it's a battle because then you know what you're, you know what you're getting into, you learn the fishery. And then when you come back, you've got all that, that info from last time. Like there's, you know, a walleye lake that's, you might want to go back to, but it's like, Oh, what if I go to the new lake and maybe I find something better. So that's, that's the constant battle for me. Cause I want to go everywhere once, which I know isn't realistic, but. Well, I was surprised to see the Amazon trip on your channel. And a lot of times if I see, it's hard for me because I, I, I'm i expecting to see Canadian waters, you know? So yeah. I, I sat down and watched it and it was fascinating and I loved it. It was not what I expected. And I actually went, I did a duck hunt in Argentina a few years ago. And cool. you, you talk about just kind of learn, learning the culture a little bit and going on an adventure to a different part of the world. I mean, that's, that's half of it. It was, it was interesting. And part of the excitement, I think was just trying to learn how to communicate with people that didn't speak English, yeah. you know, try to learn the Spanish language a little bit. And that, and that gate we're in Miami before you flew out. I'm pretty sure I slept on that floor right there. I'm pretty <laughs> sure I slept there a couple of weeks ago when I was down in Florida, I got stranded in oh, Miami overnight and I, and they were flying to Brazil out of that gate. So I'm pretty oh, really? sure it yeah. looks just like it, but, yeah. um, South America is, uh, when you rode up to the boat that you ended up staying on, I shouldn't even call it a boat, the yacht or the, the yacht, floating yeah. hotel. The floating, or, floating hotel is what they call it, yeah. When I saw the exterior of it, I was like, okay, this is interesting. This is kind of, you know, this, this reminds me of South America a little bit. When you showed the interior, I was blown away. I didn't expect that. It was, it was insane. That, that whole trip was, uh, it, it was just a moment that I didn't really, I didn't, I didn't want to get too excited about it until it actually happened. But basically it was a friend of a friend, a guy that I guided up in Northern Saskatchewan was neighbors with the owner. 
of he's he is Captain Peacock, the the owner of the floating hotel, and he he called me, and it was like March fifteenth, and he's like, oh, we'd love for you to to come you know, uh, and film at our lodge. I'm like, well, when does your season start? He's like, oh, it starts in September. So I'm like, okay, yeah, like let's set in some days. He's like, oh no, but I want you to come before the season ends. Like I want, and I'm like, well, when, when does that mean? He's like, well, can you leave in a week? And for me, <laughs> oh I, I thrive off of the last minute, spontaneous, all, all sorts of that stuff. Like you could tell me tomorrow I'm going to Africa and I'd be like, okay, that's cool. My, my wife is a little more of a creature of habit, which is, is admirable as well. And I kind of, I remember calling her and I'm like, Sam, so we kind of need to make a decision by the end of today, but do you want to go to Brazil for 10 days? <laughs> and uh, it pushed her out of her comfort zone, but I think she would agree it's one of, the, one of her favorite trips she's ever been on. So yeah, we, we booked our, our flights like a week before and uh, every aspect of it was just uh, uh, surreal. Like it was, it was, you know, my wife likes fishing. It's not what she lives and dies for. And just the fact that there's a pool on top and there's air conditioning and there's like, just everything. It was, it was, uh, it was a pretty, pretty special place. So that is a place I would, I would certainly go back to would be uh, captain sure. Peacock in Brazil. Well, it sounds like that air conditioning was welcome. It sounds like it was pretty oh, yeah. hot down there. And then I saw her catching a peacock and she was thumbing it. You were using a gripper. Is that, did they have teeth? Is there, what was the, what just was the, the re- big ones? I think they, the big ones they often use, I think you could, you could lift any fish, but the bigger ones, they just, uh, that's what the guide would do. Okay. Um, and then kind of hand it over to you sort of thing if they're landing oh, the fish. I gotcha. But yeah, we, we were so unlucky on that trip as far as big fish went. Like, um, cause every day you come back at the end of the day and you're sharing stories. And there was like, I think the biggest that, that week was a 20, there's a 22 pounder caught, you know, oh. uh, 20, 21 pounder, 17 pounder. And I think the biggest we got was a seven or eight pounder. Maybe it was the one Sam caught. So that's just how it goes. Sometimes you don't always, you don't always get lucky on that side of things, but, um, yeah, I, I, I will go back there at some point and catch a, catch a double digit peacock. They're, they're so cool that that's the closest thing I've seen to a freshwater fish or sorry, the closest thing I've seen to a saltwater fish for a freshwater fishing, as far as aggression and like the tenacity and the fact that they can turn on and turn off so fast. Like I've, I've only seen that in saltwater fish before. I've never seen that in a freshwater fish. So that, that one that where it kicked your, your top water, like 10 feet or whatever. That yeah. was awesome. And then we got to show, so that big one, Sam caught the big one, right? It was about yeah. eight pounds. Or Do we have that? Yeah. We got the audio with this one. Cause we had to keep the audio with this one. Cause this is great. I just love the emotion on this. Do we have audio? Look up. That's a big one, man. It just popped my lure at me like 10 feet. Talk to me, Sam. Oh, keep it tight. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Lift. That's a big one. Oh my goodness. Come on. Come on. Oh, oh yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Oh. 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 <laughs> we got him. Oh. So. So. <laughs> yeah, the reaction's so good. Yeah. You can hold him with the bogey if you want. Yeah, yeah there we go. Hold it a little bit higher. And yeah. One last geez. look at that monster. Look at the colors on that. And that's only an eight pounder. They get so much bigger. All right, going over the side. Yeah, I can't imagine a 20 pounder. Right? Well, that whole sequence, and then I think, do we have the release shot? That whole sequence from, from kicking the kicking that top water to her catching it and the emotion of it. And then that release shot that you got on it. Uh, that, I think that's my favorite part of that, that film that you did. Thank you. Yeah. No, it's, it's, uh, yeah, it's just a different world down there. And those fish are, those fish are stunning. Like it's, uh, yeah. And our, it's just so funny. Like you said, with the language barrier and stuff too, like our guide's name was Nacho. I don't know if Nacho. that's his actual name or what they, what they gave him, but like, Oh yeah. We just had no, it, he would just, he would know the word cast basically. And he would just tell us to keep casting at the same spot. And I remember one moment where like he kept telling us to cast at the same spot. And I don't think I'm necessarily the easiest person to guide. Cause I, I'll be honest. I don't really like being guided. Like if they would have given me the keys to the boat, I would have just gone off on my own. Um, and he kept telling us to cast the same tree. And finally I'm like, Sam, I knew he, I like, I knew he wasn't understanding us. And I was like, Sam, I'm not going to cast at that tree anymore. And she's like, no, just, just keep casting at the tree. I'm like, we've cast that out so many times. And then I, I like, I, my, my body language was probably showing a little bit that I was getting frustrated and I cast it at the tree again and caught one. And I'm like, 
He was right. He was right. I should always trust your guide. Always trust your guide. Always trust your guide. That's right. Um, The, uh, you know, that, the most unexpected part of that trip though, was when he went to visit that village and they were the, they had the doctors and the dentists with, I'm, I'm glad that was a part of it. That was a really neat part of that film. Yeah. So, I mean, basically he gives, I don't know if he gives free trips or discounts to doctors and dentists and stuff, but he, he does the outreach to the community. Cause I think that's, I think that's something a lot of fishing lodges deal with is coming into these communities and kind of taking over, you know, whether it be, you know, on a, on a lake up North where there's a, you know, a native reservation or if it's down South where there's these villages along the, the Rio Negro river. Um, so it's cool. So they bring these doctors in, they get, you know, a discount or a free fishing trip, whatever it is. And then they go into the village and they'll give them free dental care, free health care. And it's a part of the trip and it's just a cool outreach. Um, and I, th- I think a lot of people are like happy to do that on a trip, especially if you've got, you know, skills to share. It's like pe- people are happy to, to, to share their skills. And I think that's a cool way that the lodge gives back. And yeah, I, I can't really say I've seen that with other, uh, you know, outfitters before. Well, you have to, if, especially if you're not, you know, local, if you're coming into a community like that, you have to find a way to give back to that community or work with them or, or help out. And man, I just, I just thought that was great that, uh, yeah. that they do that. And then the, the drone shot at the end of that big floating hotel, pulling all those boats, crazy. Oh, it's pretty cool. Yeah. It's, uh, I don't know how many, how many aluminum boats they have on there. I think they have like, well, probably 12 or I don't know how many. Yeah. Probably 12 there. And it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's pretty impressive to see that whole thing going like, and I wouldn't want to be the guy driving that. It would be, uh, <laughs> yeah. it's a lot of work to get it all set up and stuff, but I mean, they have it down to a science and they fit a lot of people on that, uh, on that barge. Yeah. Pretty cool. All just right. the engineering. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, just to be able to, like, I get nervous towing one boat half the time, but, yeah. uh, <laughs> you know, but being able to tow and just how, you know, how they have to hook them all up to keep them in line like that. That's pretty neat. Yeah. I want to talk about one more trip before we let you go here. I hope we're, I know we're keeping you pretty long today. No, you're uh, good. But I want to talk about that trip to, is it Isinglass? Yeah. Isinglass, the journey to Isinglass. Um, First, as a guy who who does some filming and some interviews, it was weird to see you doing a sit down interview in front of Ken. So I interviewed myself in the backyard. Yeah, people are probably like, "Why is this guy filming himself?" But I just thought it was it was a way to a way to tell the story. But yeah, I, I'm. It's always funny interviewing yourself because you get some funny looks. If I was outside, so otherwise people wouldn't see it when I'm interviewing myself. Right. But <laughs> so, did you just pick out like a tree to stare at then, so it looked like you were? Or did you have somebody off camera? Actually, I, I think I think Sam. I think my wife was asking oh, okay. me questions. I, I don't I don't remember completely, but I just remember <laughs> like it's starting to snow and sleet, and I'm trying to mm-hmm. film this interview, and I was like, I got to get it done. Um, but yeah, that, that was uh, that was a. But that and, and the fries from the food truck looked amazing. By the way, <laughs> yes, that's a must. Yeah, mm, in Uh But the colors. So you were on a row. Oh yeah, here's the. We got to show you the fries on the from the food truck. So that's a chip truck. The chip truck. There's a couple of those in Kenora, and it's. Uh, yeah, pretty much. They just sell French fries and oh, yeah. uh, it's, it's a, it's a must stop for anyone coming through. Mm, so good. Um, so you got to go to go to Isinglass. So you got to go down a road that you had to get a permit for. Is that right? Yeah. So it, I mean, there, yeah, we could, we could go down a rabbit hole talking about Isinglass and, and everything beyond that. Um, so yeah, there, there's an old mining road and basically if you are, uh, you know, part of the, part of the mining, if you're, if you're doing work on that road, then you can get a pass to, to go down that road. And we're like, well, we're doing tourism and tourism is kind of like a, a resource. So, uh, you know, my neighbor, Scott, who I've, you know, partnered with on a few projects, he's like, well, we'll see if we can get a permit. So he, he got this permit and it allowed us to get, you know, close to the lake, not right to the lake. And then to bring in the scuba gear and all that stuff, um, because we could have done it portaging, but I just don't think it would have been as realistic um, given how cold it was, time of year, all that stuff. So we were pretty fortunate to be able to do that. And just to, to, show, to show the area in, in a different way, right? Like anyone could do this trip and do it without traveling the road. It would just take a, a little bit longer. And, you know, most people aren't taking camera gear and all that extra gear that we took, right? right. So people could, you know, portage in there with, with scuba gear and do it on their own. 
Well, being able to dive in, uh, you know, clear Canadian Lake like that had to have been amazing. And I, I need to get certified because I want to do that and I want to get an underwater housing and I want to do some shooting underwater. I think that would be just fascinating. And this, this lake trout footage that you got, and I, I do so much with Lakers up in Saskatchewan. I want to do this so bad. I can, I can run like a, an inline camera down to about 60 feet without any lights yeah. and, and get footage. I would love to go down there with a big camera and shoot fish like this. That had a yeah, cool. that was pretty unique. And they were, they're, they're kind of spooky though. But yeah, that day was like a blizzard above the water. And, um, <laughs> but it was something, something I wanted to do. Cause I haven't really seen too much aside from aqua view of like swimming, swimming with lake trout. They weren't big ones. Those were all like two, three pounders, Sure, but um, you know, something, something unique. And yeah, the scuba world is definitely uh, unlocked, you know, all sorts of filming potential and, and you just learn. I, that, that's the reason I wanted to get into scuba diving beyond the video content aspect. It was just like, I want to learn what fish do and how they react. And like, you know, I've yet to see a walleye underwater, but I've seen bass because bass will come up to you and you knock rocks together and they'll come right up to you. Walleyes, you kind of see a dust cloud. And it's like, there probably used to be a walleye there, but he's a little smart. <laughs> he's gone. Food, so, well, we got some yeah. mine lakes up around uh, Crosby, Minnesota, uh, the Cayuna lakes where guys will go with dive gear and cameras and then ice fishing rods. And they'll, nice. they'll sit right down on the bottom of the lake and they'll jig for small mouth and large mouth and they'll catch That's them on cool. ice rods sitting on the bottom of the lake. It's pretty neat. And without getting too nerdy into, into cameras, camera stuff, like how, when you got that footage of those lake trout, like how, how soon did you re try to review footage and how cool was it? Like when you get that feeling that you just captured something that you've never seen before, how cool of a feeling is that? Yeah. I, I like, I want to guard that memory card. I'm like nervous pulling it out and then putting it into the computer for the first time. <laughs> yeah. I've like this, this one story that I was, uh, I was guiding and the guest caught a 46 or 47 inch pike. And I pulled the memory card out and at the lodge I was working at, they had a person called a photo tech and they would categorize all the photos and make a slideshow for the guests. Sure. And I handed the memory card to the photo tech. And when she put it into the back of the computer, she put it in at a, at a weird angle oh, and the no. card just split open and they lost all their photos and it was just like, how do you, how do you come back from that? How do you explain cool. that to your guests? I, uh, you know, I've had a situation, you know, losing wedding photos for a client, which has only happened oh, once. Boy. And it was only some of the photos, but it's like, same thing. I have been fortunate with, with outdoor stuff that I haven't, I haven't really had any catastrophic losses, but that's always in the back of my head. So like, especially when I'm dealing with underwater stuff, I'll often bring my laptop in the boat and I'll actually back it up on location sometimes, or just to make sure the camera's filming. Cause Sometimes with the underwater stuff, you don't always know for sure if it's filming. Uh, you know, if I have my camera in a housing, I can, I can, you know, review the footage. But there's always that off chance that something gets messed up. So, I, yeah, I knock on wood. I've been pretty fortunate with not losing much of that stuff. But it's always, uh, it's always in the back of my head, you know, sure. or well, if I, I'm pressing record or not. Yeah. Well, I, I was just down in, in Florida at Bienville shooting the Shimano thing and, uh, I, I was in the boat with one of the pros and he, he caught this bass and it was in trees, right? So it was bouncing yeah. up through logs and bouncing and rolling over branches and this and that. And I had it all in slow-mo and I'm like, oh my gosh, because yeah. the slow-mo records without sound. So I'm like, this is amazing. This is going to be so cool. Yeah. And I'm talking to him as I'm getting it. He brings it in. I interview him in the boat. And he talks about his, you know, why he's using braid. And this is why yeah. this is a great example of the tough gear that we use. And did then there's not, no audio. Did not. Well, I didn't hit record. I missed the whole oh. fish. So I thought oh. it was rolling, but uh, apparently when I pressed the button, I didn't press down hard enough. And then I was focusing so much on, on my focus speaking and getting the shot and framing and all that. Yeah. I didn't, I couldn't see the little red record up in the corner. And, uh. but uh, you know, that's the way it goes sometimes. Um, oh yeah. I mean, that, that's just, it's, if you do it long enough, it's going to happen. It's going to like, happen. it's just, yeah. Yeah, for sure. A couple of, just a couple of last things on that trip, yeah. that raft. I didn't expect to see a raft with the two canoes built like that. That was pretty wild. I'd, I'd never seen that before. Yeah. My, my, my buddy, Scotty, who planned the trip, he, uh, that was his brainchild and it was so stable. And Sam was, my wife, Sam was the captain in the middle sitting there. She didn't even have to paddle. So it was, it was perfect <laughs> for her and it was cool. You know, it, it was all, you know, part of the story and being able to show that. And, you know, that's what I like about those longer films too, is you can, you can get into the story and it's not just, uh, it's not always cut, cut and dry to the, the, the bare bones. You can yeah, like look at all the gear we had on there. Right. Yeah. That's brilliant. So obviously it was fairly calm that day. How stable do you yeah. think that would have been in some higher winds? Oh, it would have been good. You would have gotten like splashes of water over the front, but it would have been, yeah, incredibly stable. Yeah. It, 
and the colors on those trees. I mean, that was perfect timing. Out it was there. the best time of year. Yeah. Like we didn't see any lake trout on the first lake. We had to go to a different lake to find lake trout, but just as far as timing goes for color and the clarity of the water, it was just, yeah. Like as soon as I looked at it on Google maps, I'm like, okay, this, this lake is pretty special. And that's what I heard. And, and that video, it, it definitely got a little bit of kickback and that's, that's mm -hmm. the problem with what I do. And I think these days with social media is, is it's a fine line because conservation comes from people knowing about stuff, but people don't always want you to know about stuff. Oh, so it's right. just like in that video, I'm like, let's protect this resource. It's a special place. And I, I know a couple of people uh, that messaged me or I heard through the grapevine and they're like, I can't believe Jay showed that lake. I can't believe he exposed Isinglass. Uh, and, and it's, I don't know exactly the reasoning. Some people, it might be legit reasoning that they just don't want people there. Other people want to keep it by themselves. But fun little fact about that video is yeah, it got backlash. I got multiple messages from people, but there was a big meeting with some, you know, big corporations and they wanted to create a mine on that lake. And they were in the stages of getting approval to build a mine on Isinglass and that video got shown at the meeting and they voted down building the mine on the lake. Get and out it's of just here. like, yeah. And that I only found, I only found out that a couple months ago and like, it gives me goosebumps just talking about it. Cause I haven't shared that story with anyone, but it's just like, th that goes back to what I said at the start is conservation only comes with people knowing about stuff. So it's just like, it's like, you know, if, if I, I don't want to take credit for that because the, the video is so much bigger than me, but it's just like, maybe maybe it helped maybe that was part of the reason why it got voted down so i mean i i'd, I'd like to think that i like to think that it helped protect that lake but i think sometimes people are a little short-sighted on yeah. their own personal you know motives on that stuff and i i get that it's nice to be on a lake when you never see anybody but yeah i love the outdoors and i love to share it and it's like if you want to go to the work of paddling in there um you know do it and and bring people and and pick up your trash when you're done and it's great, you know? Yeah. So that's the beauty of places like that. Um, you know, as long as you make it, a, you know, create a few barriers to make it tough to get in, you can usually keep some of those places fairly like the boundary waters, keep them fairly wild. If they're, if they're tough to get in, you know, they try to build a cell tower by the boundary waters here for a long time. I can't remember if they actually ended up building it, but they didn't want it built. The locals didn't want it built because I was just going to bring more traffic and make it easier yeah. to be in there. Um, and and, the, and that brings up a whole other discussion. This is probably for a different podcast, but that brings up another discussion of of um, social media and how to use it. And yeah. and you want to show people some of these things and show some some stories. And you know, for our TV show, a lot of times if we're doing a fishing story, we won't we won't name the lake sometimes for that very yep. reason. We'll try to protect, unless it's Lake of the Woods or Mille Lacs, you know, some big body of water, that's, it's no yep. secret, but we'll try to protect some of those areas, but it's so hard, especially when you find such a unique story. And I've got a couple of stories in the back of my brain that I've wanted to do, you know, a, a, a go and film or interview or whatever. And they won't let me They're like, no, we yep. don't, we don't want the attention. I'm like, this is an amazing story. And they're like, well, it's, it's our story and you know about it and that's good enough for us. And I was like, well, yeah, I, I respect that, I guess, but man, it's, that, tough. it's it, yeah, no, go ahead. No, it's, it's, it's just that constant fine line. It's just like, you know, you hear, you hear stories both ways, you know? Mm -hmm. So, well, that's just something we need to navigate. And, and, and I think, you know, put, put good information out there too on, on selective harvest on catch and release and all those things. I think it's like, that's part of the duty as well. Not just like, here's how you catch them. Here's yeah. how you release them too. If, if you catch a big one or if you don't, you know, so. That's really become a big part of what we do here is to try to protect, uh, protect our resources and, and promote sustainability. Uh, we yep. love to eat fish and, uh, and obviously there's a product I want to try on some of my fish, by the way, that we can mention, but, um, I also, you know, at, at Tazan Lake, where I do a lot of stuff, I'm in, I'm in Northwest Saskatchewan. It's all catch and release yeah. on the big fish. We don't, yep. guys get mad at us because we won't let them mount, you know, a 50 pound lake trout. And it's like, well, you get a good picture of it. We got a girth yeah. measurement. We got a length measurement and get a replica done. And it's going to last a lot longer and look a lot better. And it's going to yeah. protect the resource. Absolutely. So that sustainability is an important thing. Uh, before we let you go, tell us about uh, the cooking world that you're getting into. Yeah, you know, uh, I was in uh, in the ice shack with my buddy, Josh McFadden. This was probably two years ago, two and a half years ago. And, you know, Josh Josh is a major foodie. He's always experimenting with wild game and different things. And um, he, we were cooking fish. And then uh, I was like, you know what, we should, 
we should start, you know, maybe, maybe a fish batter company. Maybe we can market this and turn this into something. And uh, we started looking around because like the big term on YouTube was catch and cook. And it was just like that. That's what people called it. They'd catch fish, they'd cook them. And I'm like, I wonder if there's a business called catch and cook. So we started searching and there was no business called catch and cook. And it's like, how, how is this possible? How is, how is nobody taking this yet? So I think that was part of the reason why we're like, let's, let's start this up. So Josh had the original recipe. I tried it. I was like, okay, I sign off on this. I, I like it. So I've been, I've been in the product development, uh, you know, with the other flavors since we got three flavors of coatings, we got three spices, we dropped a, a folding fillet knife. Mm. Um, and, uh, the, the reception has been phenomenal. It's, it's been super cool to, uh, yeah, to share it with, with my audience and with, you know, people that just love to eat fish. Cause I think the vast majority of people, and, and, you know, we, we often say it's a fish coating, but it's for everything. You know, you can, it's cool to see how people have experimented with it and they'll use it for, you know, grouse or use it sure. for, uh, anything for shrimp, for, for chicken, whatever, whatever they have accessible and just people sharing it with me, seeing what they're doing and, you know, getting creative with it. And we want it to be like an interactive, uh, an interactive space. And, um, that's, that's kind of what catch and cook is, has become. And, uh, so right now you can order it off our website, but we're working on getting it into the States. So if, okay. if someone listening right now happens to, uh, own a tackle store in the States, that that's our goal for our, our focus for 2022 is, you know, getting it onto the shelves in the States, um, at a, at a Bain tackle shop near you. So do you, I, mean, sell, I think I, do you, sorry, I'm sorry, do you get sales in the States from your website? How, how easy yeah, is yeah, that? We get, yeah. That's super easy. If someone wants to order from catch they can do that. Um, but I know not everyone wants to pay for the shipping. Right. right. Um, cause I, I personally didn't think people, I didn't know. I'm like, well, people buy fish batter online. Is that a thing? And then people have bought online. So that's been great. Mm-hmm. But I understand that fish coating spices is the type of thing where you go fishing for the day, you stop at the tackle store on the way home and you pick up some coating. It's not the type of thing that I would necessarily think about, Oh, I need to order some before this trip. I'd pick some up at the local gas station. Right. So that's what we're trying to, uh, you know, expand into, we know there's a lot of fishermen in the States that eat fish. So we, uh, you know, it's, it's been fun. I think, uh, we're going to continue to go ahead. Can I just point out one thing? You started, uh, a company with, a with a guy that involves food and he served you uncooked sausages, I think. Right. Wasn't that, <laughs> <laughs> that's a good one. You're, you're very true. Yeah. He hasn't lived that one down. People got a lot of laughs out of that. There's a clip in one of our videos and, and Josh has this, this sausage he got from uh, some, some, an Asian cooking store. So it's got all, I, I'm not sure what the writing is on there, but obviously, you know, there's a little bit of English. And then, so we're starting eating these sausages. It's kind of sweet and kind of, you know, kind of a weird texture and flavor. And then like uh, underneath a lot of the, the text, it just says, do not eat raw in English in like really small writing. And I'm just, and then I spit it out. He spits it out. And, uh, we turned it into a TikTok that got a lot of views. It was pretty funny because it's just like one of those little small moments in the, in the video. And it's just like, uh, like I, I don't, I don't hold it. Neither of us got sick. So I don't, I don't hold it against him, but, and that's the thing too. It's like, you never know what you're going to capture when the camera's rolling all day. You just like, I do a lot of stupid stuff. A lot of it I edit out. Some of it stays in, but like just goofy stuff like that. Right. Eating undercooked so- or uncooked sausages. That's great. Well, um, I'll tell you what, man, you know, I'm sure people tell you you live in the dream and it's, it's this, it's this era's version of watching that television host when when we were young, right? Like this is the new, this is the new outdoor job that everybody I think wants to have. And I think you've kind of, you're, you're, you've set a benchmark for creating outdoor content, outdoor video content. And, um, you know, I think you're doing a great job. Keep up the good work. Um, I really appreciate the, t- the time here on the show. And what can we look forward to here in the future? What do you got next? Oh, well, first off, thank you. I, I, I want to say, like, I know that I'm the luckiest guy. Like, I'm living, I'm living my dream every day, and I'm, I'm so blessed that, that people actually want to watch the videos because you upload a video, and I don't know, you think maybe no, one, no one's going to watch it, you right? So know. just the, the, fact yeah. that, the fact that people are watching is cool. Um, what's next? Um, Things, things will probably slow down for a, like a little bit. I, uh, I got a couple like bigger projects, a couple films, actually my first moose hunt. Cool. Um, I went to Texas for a week and did a bunch of bass fishing. So that'll be like a longer format film as well. Um, things are probably going to slow down a little bit now because, you know, I think a lot of the Midwest and a lot of, a lot of people are just have their eyes set on open water on springtime already. So a lot of the ice fishing content I'll film in the next month will actually 
be stockpiled for October, November, when people are getting revved up for ice fishing. So I'm going to be ice fishing pretty much every day for the next three weeks. Um, but all that footage is going to be kind of waiting for waiting for next year. So um, I'm not sure exactly what my YouTube channel is going to look like in the next six months in June. Um, in June, my going to have my first child. So oh, yeah, uh, that's right. Ba- baby on the way in June. So I Congrats. don't know, like I, thank you. I, I've already had the discussion with my wife. Like, how do we feel about having, you know, showing, showing that in, in our content, you know, having, having our, our baby boy part of it. And, uh, you know, I, I think I want to show, I want to show the, the, the real struggles of being a parent and doing outdoor stuff. And, uh, cause that's something I've always strived for on the channel is to be relatable. And mm-hmm. I know it's not going to be easy. Um, I'm 110% excited, but there's going to be, there's going to be tough things. Like how, how do you bring a kid fishing? How do you bring a kid ice fishing and not ruin the sport for them? But, uh, you know, obviously with it, with an infant, they don't really know what's going on, but when they get older, like, what does that look like? So, uh, I'm ready to navigate that and share that with, with the people that, that watch the videos. So, so it, it used to be a thing to film the birth. I, I think there needs to be a lot of slow-mo and get the drone. If can you get the drone into the hospital? And, <laughs> yeah. No. We've made jokes about, about Sam wearing the Sam cam about the GoPro. And <laughs> she told me she wants me to take pictures and I'm just like, ah, I don't know. I'm just like, I feel like this is a sacred moment. Yeah. Um, that's, but tough. we'll see whatever, you know what she's, she has to carry the baby around. Um, for all those weeks. So whatever she wants me to do, I will do and just try to be the best father possible. And, uh, if that means taking pictures or if she just needs to squeeze my hand, then that's, that's, that's what'll happen. But I'm, I'm excited for the next chapter. It'll, it'll, it'll shake things up, but we'll we'll change the world. No doubt. Yeah. Well, man, uh, again, appreciate the time. Keep up the good work and, uh, thanks for being on the show and good luck. Good luck, uh, in June. Thank you guys. Sporting journal radio is a division of Macaba LLC. If you've got a question, comment, or story idea for us, send us an email. Go to sportingjournalradio.com. While you're there, you can learn how to advertise on the show and visit our store for hats, hoodies, coffee mugs, and more. Go to sportingjournalradio.com. Ice fishing season is here. This winter, plan a trip to Devil's Lake, North Dakota. Not only will you have the chance to catch their legendary perch, but this year, Hay Bale Heights has been catching big walleye after big walleye. And they're doing it from a mobile, comfortable snow bear. No matter how cold it is outside, you're warm and toasty on the inside. Learn more and book a trip today at haybaleheights.com. That's haybaleheights.com. Haybale Heights.